sermon text this morning from the Gospel of St. Mark. Truly, truly, I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the children of man and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but he is guilty of an eternal sin. The words of our text. Please be seated. Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ of God. Amen. So right up front, we're going to confess this morning that God wants all people to be saved. The apostle writes to Timothy, he says, God desires all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. And all people means exactly what it says, all people. Everyone, from Adam and Eve to the last person who will ever be conceived on this planet, God wants all people to be saved. As Jesus said to Nicodemus, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Jesus uses the words world and whoever, whoever Jesus says does God's will is my brother and sister and my mother. What then is God's will? God's will is that everyone come to a knowledge of the truth and be saved. That will that we believe in Jesus Christ as the God-man who is our substitute, who won salvation for us, who redeemed all human beings. Before his ascension, Jesus gives the Great Commission. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So, salvation is open to all people. But God does not force anybody into his kingdom. He does not push people into his kingdom. So then what would be the result of the word of God? Clearly, when the word of God is proclaimed to people, some hear the word and they repent and they trust Christ for their salvation. Others fiddle away their time, assuming that there will always be time to repent later and seek out the gospel of Jesus Christ. And oftentimes they receive the declaration spoken upon the wealthy landowner. You fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Some hear, but they refuse the gospel invitation and they are cast into the outer darkness where there is wailing and gnashing of teeth. Some even grow up in the middle of the church, but do not let God's word have its way with them. Reminds me of one of the scariest sermon illustrations I had ever had, and it is pointed at the clergy. It says too many of the clergy even are like Noah's carpenters, building an ark for somebody else to be saved in. Still some harden their hearts, And they refuse every attempt of the Spirit to enter into their heart and begin the work of regeneration, the tearing down through the law and the building up through the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then there's this curious case of the sin against the Holy Spirit. What is that? Because people usually encounter that. And again, uh, people wonder, have I done that? Have I committed that sin? What is that sin? In essence, what is this? It is the willful hardening of the heart against the word of God and against the means of forgiveness. And it is the willful hardening of the heart by someone who was once a believer, someone who knows better, who knows the word of God, but not only rejects the urgings of the Holy Spirit and the promptings of the Holy Spirit, but also verbally mocks the word of God. So what's going on with this sin. The sin against the Holy Spirit essentially amounts to the rejection of forgiveness. The person rejects what God has to offer to them. There's no fear of God in the heart. Now, please remember that if a person is afraid of having committed this sin, you haven't committed this sin. You haven't done it. Because somebody who has committed the sin against the Holy Spirit doesn't care. They're not worried about it and they mock God for it. The scripture goes to great lengths to show us the mercy of God. Jesus accuses no one of sin in this text. Did you you notice this? Um, He accuses no one of the sin against the sin of the the Holy Spirit. So he's really working with people. He's really 
discussing and talking with them. He's warning them. He says, hey, folks, you're getting perilously close to pushing the Holy Spirit out of your heart. He says, gives them the warning. Don't, don't do that. Consider the teachers of the law. What do the teachers of the law do? Well, these men are accusing Jesus of being in league with the devil. That's what they're accusing him of. By Beelzebub, the prince of demons, he is casting out demons. Is this blasphemy? Of course it's blasphemy of the greatest sort. What does Jesus do to them? He invites them for a sit down. Hey, fellas, come here. Sit down, let's have a talk. And he, and he lays out their logic and he tears their logic down. He says, look, here's the deal. If Satan is against Satan, then his kingdom cannot stand. Now, these people had said terribly awful things about Jesus, and he still works at their salvation. He says, if satanic forces are aligned against satanic forces, then Satan himself is finished. There's dissension in the ranks. Jesus points out to them things don't work out that way. Jesus is also letting us know that Satan is a real personal being, the same real personal being whom we see introduced to us in Genesis, uh, in our Old Testament reading for this Sunday. He is a creature who has set himself against the will of the Creator. Now, when was Satan bound? When was he bound? Genesis 3.15. We read that this morning when the Lord looked at the, the serpent. Basically, the Lord is speaking to Satan and say, saying, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between her seed and your seed. You will strike his heel and he will strike your head or crush your head. I like that translation a little better. He will crush your head. Right There's the first promise of the Savior. God is binding the devil and his kingdom at that moment. When Jesus comes on the scene, Jesus is taking what belongs from the devil's kingdom and ripping it out of the devil's kingdom. That's that whole, unless you bind the strong man. Jesus is showing very clearly by his word, casting out demons, that he is stronger than all demonic forces. You know, Jesus is telling the teachers of the law, hey, look, guys, you're being blinded. You see what's going on. The kingdom of Satan is being plundered, and yet you won't admit it. If you keep this up, then you really are throwing in with the devil and his forces, and that would be sinning against the Holy Spirit. If you persist in this, you'll shut out the Spirit, and you will be lost. And then there's the other case of Jesus' family. What do we do with Jesus' family in this instance? Without a doubt, Jesus' family, even his mother, blasphemed against the second person of the Trinity by saying that he was out of his mind. What do they mean by that? Like, do they think Jesus has gone plumb crazy? I don't think so. I'm not exactly sure what they mean, but if I had to hazard a guess, uh, we look a few chapters before this one and what's going on. Jesus is casting out demons. Jesus is contending with the scribes and the Pharisees and the Herodians. He's getting into all kinds of uh, arguments with them. He's putting them in their place. He's outmaneuvering them at every step, and they're getting angry, and the scripture records for us in an editorial comment, they wanted to destroy him, right? Now, here he is again, arguing with the, the scribes and the teachers of the law. What would you do to your kid if they were in that position? What would you do with your cousin or your brother in that position? You know, I can imagine the words that we in our culture might say. Hey, you're going to get yourself in trouble. You better cool your jets, okay? Just settle down a little bit, right? You're feeling your oats just a little too much, and you need to back off. You know, in our kind of language, it would seem to me that Jesus is poking the bear, and his mother and his brothers are coming to him and saying, man, you gotta knock this off or bad things are gonna happen. Like, you're out of your mind acting like this. Seems to me that that seems as kind of what's going on. And Jesus, he won't have anything of it. it, it was that blasphemy against the Son of God? It, it really was. But we can wrap our heads around that kind of fear. Now imagine for a second, if you will, how Jesus' mother and his brothers felt and the rest of his family felt after the resurrection. What would you do if you had tried to knock your brother off the path of his 
the course of what he was doing, and then you find out your brother really is the incarnate son of the true and living God. Yeah, that's, that's a little stiff right there. And you're thinking, oh my gosh, we, we, they would, they're well versed in their Old Testament. They're gonna be thinking the same thing that Isaiah is thinking. Woe is me, I am undone, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I come from a people of unclean lips. Wow, right? You would be a wreck. You watched your son get crucified. You watched your brother get crucified. You watched your cousin get crucified. And then you see him risen from the grave and you have the stunning realization that this man really is exactly who he said he was, the son of God. The words of Jesus would come back to you. Imagine the words coming back and what great comfort and gospel it was to hear those words again. Every sin will be forgiven the children of man and whatever blasphemies they utter will be forgiven. How that must have been the sweetest memory of his family, right? Because even that sin of blasphemy against the Son of God will be forgiven people. No sin, right? Now remember this, everybody here today, I want you to remember this. No sin is so large that the repentant heart can't be forgiven. No sin is so large that the repentant heart can't be forgiven. And that's good to hear. Right? Because there are times when Christians imagine that they have committed the sin against the Holy Spirit. There are times when Christians are so worried that their sins are so large that they can't be forgiven. And there are times when Christians are simply beset with the most horrible, awful, wicked thoughts. And they can't get rid of them. Have you ever had that experience? The things that are going on in your head, thanks be to God we don't let them come out of our mouth. But if people could hear what we were oftentimes thinking, we would blush with shame and they would turn away from us. We are beset by the devil with such things. The devil shoots his fiery arrows into the hearts of all Christians, causing them to turn over in their hearts and their minds the most horrible thoughts against God and against their heavenly Father and against the Holy Spirit. Even when such thoughts are clearly against your will, they still right into your head. That's, that's like as C.F.W. Walther said, he's the first president of the Missouri Synod. He said, you know, if I'm sitting in a room in good clothes and somebody chucks in mud through an open window, that's not my fault. He goes, there's nothing I can do about that. He said, those thoughts come from the devil. They are unbidden, you do not will them, you do not want them, they are satanic thoughts. He's poking at you. He's trying to get you to think wicked and evil and horrible things. Put them away. They're not your thoughts. Ask your Lord for protection. Ask your Lord for forgiveness, right? right? Christians are harassed when we're going to communion. Who knows what we're thinking as we come up to communion? Who knows what we're battling inside our minds and in our hearts and spirits as we approach the altar? Right, because the devil will give us no rest within or without. So what do we do? First of all, we hold the tongue and don't utter those words. We keep them inside our head and inside our chest and we fight with them on our own. We call upon Jesus to banish such thoughts from us and we let Jesus and his word be a shield and weapon for each and every one of us. So Christians in distress still have faith. Right? Even in your worst distresses, you still have faith and the Spirit of God is still working within you. Be sorrowful, be repentant, be receptive of God's grace and develop resolve to battle against your sins. Look to Jesus and friends, always remember to the repentant heart, your God forgives everything. In Jesus' name, amen. And now may that peace which passes all understanding be in your hearts and minds through the one true faith in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.
You have been sharing in the morning worship at Zion Lutheran Church, 205 Pulaski Street in Lincoln, Illinois, and just heard Rev. Mark Thompson deliver this morning's message. If you cannot be physically present, join us every Sunday morning on the radio at 8 a.m. on WLLM 1370 a.m. or WLLM 105.3 FM or on Facebook Live or on the Internet at www.zlclinc.org. Zion services are also available on Cable Channel 5 and on the LCTV app on your smartphone on Sunday at 10 a.m. and 5 p.m. and on Wednesdays at 5 p.m. Zion is a member congregation of the Worldwide Fellowship of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. If you are without a church home, we invite you to become a part of our Zion family. If we may assist you in any way, please call us at 217-732-3946 or write to us at Zion Lutheran Church, 205 Pulaski Street, Lincoln, Illinois, 62656. Zion also offers a premier education with a Christian worldview for children from age 3 through the 8th grade at Zion Lutheran School. If you would like more information concerning our school, please contact the school office at 217-732-3977. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Amen.